Hi, welcome to SB Online. All of our students entering 6th through 12th grades are invited to join us for Welcome Wednesday. We'll be in the fellowship hall this Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30 for pizza and games as we welcome our new 6th graders to student ministry. All parents are invited to stay from 7.30 to 8 for a brief parent meeting. We're excited to share that, Lord willing, our life groups reopen this coming Sunday, August 16th. Groups for all age groups will be available at 9.30 and 11. As ministry begins to reopen, we continue to be grateful for the gifts that you give. Don't forget that online giving is still available at give.westb.org. Thanks for joining us. Let's worship together. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse with Him. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is.
amazing. It's a name for people. Um, people being nice to each other. God loves us. He dies for us. And I hear it from my Nona all the time. Sit gracefully. Like a new book or a new toy. It gives you a lot of stuff. But humans don't give him a lot. Give people hugs. You have to believe him with all of your heart. You have to ask him to be forgiven or saved. Yes. No matter what you do, there cannot be a single thing. You, you still have to pray for him and do whatever you can do to get forgiven. But no being bad again. No, we can't. Not at all. Can bunch of people. If you if you keep doing stuff after you got forgiven, you, I don't know what would happen. One way to understand a concept is to look at the opposite. So the opposite of love is hate. The opposite of good is bad. The opposite of win is lose. The opposite of heaven is hell. What is the opposite of grace? You know, geopolitically, tyrants use oppression as a way to subdue an entire nation state. And economically, loan sharks and payday lenders trap people in a vicious cycle of, of debt. In the home, if we're talking about the opposite of grace, you know, something as simple as a thermostat can become a point of contention. Theologically, perhaps the opposite of grace is karma. You know, it's a popular thing to say, that's karma for you. Grace is getting from God what you don't deserve. Karma is getting from yourself what you deserve. And, you know, it's amazing to me how many people can deny Jesus as if believing in God is some silly, primitive, mawkishly sentimental religious drivel. And, and yet, these same people will believe in karma. Now, don't be fooled. Karma talk is a bunch of hogwash. You don't want what you deserve. Karma turns grace into a platitude. Basically, just be nice now. You know what? Karma does not work if you're a soldier in a foxhole. Karma does not work when you hear that your child is terminally ill. Karma does not work when the, when the doctor says the word cancer. We need grace. We need God's grace. So we're continuing in this series called We Believe. We're covering several topics that make up our eight-part confessional statement at West Bradenton. And uh, when you look at the word grace in the Bible, it appears over 250 times, at least in some form. And so let me give you our doctrinal statement on grace. Here it is. We believe God offers eternal life as a free gift and that it must be received by faith alone through God's grace alone. The life that comes from this gift is a permanent possession of the one receiving it. Now, what exactly is grace? Let's define the term. Grace is unmerited favor from an unobligated giver. It's unmerited favor, meaning we don't deserve it. It's, it comes from an unobligated giver, which means God doesn't have to give it. 
So we don't deserve it. God doesn't have to give it, but he is that giver. He is the one who gives us the free gift of salvation that is grace. Let me take you to our first text. It's found in Romans 3. So take out your Bibles, turn them on, open them up, scroll to where you need to go. Romans 3, look at verse 22. I'll read this to you. Romans 3, 22. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. In short, everyone deserves death. Everyone deserves hell. Everyone deserves condemnation. But through Jesus, God gives life. God gives eternity. God gives us redemption. So what this means is you cannot make yourself a Christian. Only God can do that. Grace is necessary because of our total inability to save ourselves. So when we're talking about God's grace, grace is not self-improvement. In fact, when you read what's written in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Now if by grace then it is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. It's not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. A better you is not the way to God. Now, self-improvement is not bad. It's just no way to be saved. Self-improving your way to salvation is the same as yelling louder at a corpse to live. It's just not going to work. So the only correct human response to grace is faith. Romans chapter 4 verse 16 says, this is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace. We cannot earn favor with God. So God provides salvation to us as a free gift apart from our works. God was under no obligation to uh, impute our sin to Christ or to impute Christ's righteousness to us. He didn't have to do that, but he did through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which is why Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. He talks about this free gift of grace. Let me read this to you. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift not from works so that no one can can boast. A free gift, not from works. Faith is really the exact opposite of depending on ourselves. Faith says, I give up. My works are meaningless. I need Christ. You know what's exhilarating? Grace. God owes us nothing, but then he gives us everything, and anyone can accept God's grace. In Acts chapter 15, the apostles and the elders, they gather at the Jerusalem council, and they have this debate. And in essence, they're saying, um, who can be saved and how can they be saved? So let me take you to Acts chapter 15. Let's, Let's get our Bibles out. Acts chapter 15. Let's look at verses 8 through 11. And God who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they are. So, We are saved in all the same way. Everyone is saved in the same way, by the grace of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. So how can you accept God's grace? The problem of an unsaved world is not God's lack of working. The problem of an unsaved world is our lack of response to God's grace. You know, God doesn't sit around waiting on us. I mean, he goes and he gets us. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. I mean, God's love pursues. This is a pursuing love. And, and, then, and then sometimes we'll even think, you know, I don't deserve it. So we, we don't, so we don't respond. 
But our total unworthiness is exactly why we should respond, because grace is a gift. Let me take you to one of the most popular verses in the Bible, John 3, 16. Here's what it says. He says it says, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Look how John 3.16 begins. It begins with God. It begins with God in control, but then it ends with our choice to accept Jesus. So let's walk through this. For God. God loves the world in this way. Salvation begins with God. Grace begins with God. It can't begin any other way. It has to begin with God's pursuit of us. It is God who starts this, but then God loves. That's the second part of this. Nothing about us is lovable by God. Nothing about us is attractive to God, and yet he loves us anyway. That's why it says in Romans 5, 8, God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing within us that warrants salvation. But God loved us anyway, and he loved us, so he gave. For God loved the world in this way that he gave. He gave what? He gave his son, Jesus. His death, Jesus' death, was exchanged for our lives. He died so we can live. And so what, what begins with God ends with our choice. So salvation begins with God. It's, it's him initiating his grace, but then we have a choice. Do we accept this grace? or not. So as we walk through John 3, 16, it talks about everyone who believes. You cannot gain God's love with your goodness. You cannot lose God's love with your badness. But you can refuse God's love. You have to believe. And if you believe, here's that other part of John 3, 16, if you believe, you will not perish. 2 Peter 3.9 says that God does not want any to perish. In fact, this invitation is inclusive. It's the most inclusive message that's ever been told. Anyone who wants to be saved can be saved. But the way is exclusive. It's only through Christ. But when you accept Christ, what does God give? What does God give through his grace according to John 3.16? He gives eternal life. When Christ gives us life, it's not just referring to our mere existence, our biology, this, you know, this idea that we're just alive physically. That, so it, it's, it's not that Greek word bios there. That's not the life God's talking about. There's another Greek word there. The life that God gives is the Greek word zoe, which is life in a spiritual world, life infinitely. This is the eternal life that only God can give. So you become a Christian or a follower of Christ when you accept the grace that only he can give. Grace calls you and grace saves you. And God begins the process of salvation as an act of sovereign love. But you are left with a choice. Either you accept it or you refuse it. So I'll ask you a question. Those of you who are watching, do you believe in the power of the cross do you believe in the power of Jesus' resurrection or not? For those who accept Christ and his grace, understand this. No one can lose God's grace. No one. In our doctrinal statement, it talks about grace being a permanent possession. Can you unwind God's work of regeneration in your life? No, you can't. Your will is not stronger than God's grace. No person can unwind God's work. Only Jesus saves. And once he saves, he saves completely. God does not do things halfway. He doesn't start the process of salvation only to, to stop and say, oops, I, I didn't realize that sin was in there. I was starting to save this person, but didn't realize that was there, so I got to stop now. No, when God saves you, God's grace is complete. His salvation is complete, and what God starts, he finishes. Jesus will never lose you. John writes about this in John chapter 6. Look, look at John chapter 6, verse 37 through 39 says this, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, 
but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. This is Jesus talking. You're, he's, he's never going to lose you. If you have accepted his grace, if you believe in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross, if you accept the fact that he rose again by the power of God, he came back from the dead, if you believe in that and you give all of yourself to him and, and you identify your life with Christ, that's a work of salvation that's never going to go away. Jesus will not lose you. If God's grace is perfect, then his healing is perfect. You cannot unwind God's work of salvation. And if God saves you, then you're going to last. You'll last. You know, at the beginning of all of Paul's letters, he says, grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's some version of that phrase, grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ as Paul begins his letters. It's a greeting, yes. It's, it, it's part of his salutation. It's part of his way of saying hello, but there's something greater here. It's also an introduction to the person of Jesus. Grace is not just good attitudes or shared resources. Grace isn't even a divine attribute. Grace is ultimately found in the person of Jesus. Grace is an event, yes, it's how you are saved by Jesus, but grace is also an ongoing work of God in your life. This is the Spirit's continual presence in your life. And what you need to know about Jesus, Jesus' arms are eternally strong. And his arms are open. Run to him. Run to him. Why? Because grace is the embrace of Jesus himself. Jesus tells a story, a parable, in Matthew 18 that I love. He tells about a king who decided to go through and figure out who owed him money and asked them to repay. While he was doing this, he found one guy owed him a lot of money. The Bible says 10,000 talents, which would be billions of dollars today. The king asked for his money back. The man didn't have it. The king commanded that everything the man had be sold to repay. The man fell face down and begged and pleaded and promised that he would pay it all back. The king had compassion, released the man, and forgave him all that money. He didn't have to pay it back. Man, the king showed that guy a lot of grace. Not only did he not get sent to jail, the king said the debt was totally gone. He didn't owe billions of dollars, he was free. That was grace. He not only didn't get what he deserved, which was jail, he got what he didn't deserve, freedom from all that debt. So guess what happens next? That same guy who was forgiven that big debt found a guy who owed him a little bit of money, like maybe 50 bucks. The Bible says he grabs the guy, starts choking him, and says, give me what you owe me. The man fell down and begged. Do you know what he said? Nope, and had him thrown in prison. This man who had been shown so much grace refused to show even a little bit of grace to somebody else. Do we do that too? God gives us so much grace and he forgives all of our sins. He allows us to go to heaven, which we totally don't deserve. And then we turn around and refuse to show even a little bit of grace to others. Maybe you catch yourself saying things like, I'll never forgive him, or she took my place in line, or hey, that's my cookie, or that's not fair because I didn't get fill in the blank. We're so concerned about ourselves that we forget how much grace God gave us. This week, let's remember what Pastor Sam has taught about the gift of grace that God has given to us, and let's show some of that grace to others. Talk with your family some more about that this week by looking at our devotions at kids.wsb.org. Have a great week.